Hello, my name is John Lyons, and Mr. Marshall asked me to give today's presentation for a very good reason. I'm honored to say that this hall, the town hall, has actually been named after me. Uh, it was called Lion Hall for many years. And the reason for that is when I passed away in 1920, I left a bequest of $10,000 to the town to build a town hall because there was none at that time. Uh, even though I was, had my attorney practice in Hempstead, Long Island, I am or was a Schultzville resident. I had a farm right here on Fiddler's Bridge Road just uh, past the, uh, the creek. And I really liked the town and the hamlet, and I wanted to do something uh, that would be lasting after I passed away. This is a picture of me in my uh, younger years, and uh, I was a handsome fellow at that time. <laughs> Before I uh, continue, I'd like to explain uh, why I'm dressed uh, this way. Uh, you see, um, when I was practicing in Long Island, a number of my attorney friends and myself went to many uh, large banquets and special occasions in New York City in some of the finest hotels, and this is what we wore. Well, I thought today was a, a special occasion, so I decided to wear this, and that's why you're looking at this. Um, Back to the town hall, it did, not get, um, it did not get built immediately, and the reason for that is because there was a lot of discord in town as to where the new town hall should be located. Prior to that time, town meetings were held either in the Sheltzville store or in the second floor of the store in uh, Clinton Hollow. And the discord was uh, such that uh, as many as 200 people signed a petition at that time to have the new town hall built in Clinton Hollow. Well, that didn't happen for two primary reasons. The first is uh, my executor made it very clear to the town fathers that I had desired to have the town hall in Chelsville because it was a more central location. The other reason is that uh, farmer and Chelsville farmer, George Budd, who had the farm next door, volunteered to donate part of his farmland, this site here, if they were going to build the, the uh, hall in uh, Chelsville. And that uh, pretty much sealed the deal. So here we are, located in Schultzville and not Clinton Hollow. When the building was built, one of the um, uh, primary carpenters was a Sherman Hoyt. And recently, the Clinton Historical Society had an exhibit of all the tools that Sherman used to build this building. Yes, they're still around. And that was a very successful uh, exhibit. Uh, around uh, 1960, this stage was uh, built for uh, local uh, one-act plays and melodramas, so it was a, a community uh, center. There was a, a curtain and even a dressing room in the back. In 1975, the uh, library wing was uh, built and because it was a, a badly needed addition in town. Does anybody know where the original library was before this? That's right, that balcony back there and the original bookcases are still up there. In 1988, uh, a, a major addition occurred with the um, construction of the court annex uh, with funds donated by Betty Davis in memory of her late husband, uh, Putnam uh, Davis. Up until that time, court appearances were held at the judges' homes, except when a trial was required, in which case the trial was he held here in this room. In 2004, uh, Betty Davis and other uh, citizen, residents uh, formed the Town of Clinton um, Town Hall Restoration Committee because there were some badly needed uh, repairs as well as upgrades, including replacement of the asbestos siding that was uh, on the, uh, the building. No, no tax dollars were used for this uh, large project, and I think that's an indication of the support that the town residents have and the interest in, in preserving the, uh, the buildings in uh, town. So this was the result of that uh, restoration uh, process. The next uh, addition to the historical center occurred in 2011. The town board recognized the need for additional office space and there was a costly proposal made to put a new addition on this side of the building, uh, almost the size of the uh, library addition. But the uh, town board at that time had a different vision. They envisioned that we might be able to take 
two historic buildings and reutilize them by moving them to the site, restoring them, and uh, put them to uh, community use. The first project was the uh, Spooky Hollow School. And this was located on uh, Rusky Lane in uh, Spooky, Holly Ro Spooky Hollow Road. Uh, when the Hyde Park Central School District was formed in 1939, this school was closed and the students went to Hyde Park. The uh, person who owned the property adjacent to the uh, schoolhouse, uh, Charlie uh, Clay, bought that property and as a civic uh, um, project for the town, he transformed it into a mini civic center. What he did was he, he restored the building and he added a kitchenette, a stove, a sewing machine, a phonograph, a piano, a ping pong table, and a pool table, all with uh, purchased from local uh, auctions. Uh, nearly 1,000 of the books that were in the uh, school library were maintained there for free use by the uh, adults and uh, children. It was, uh, it was free. Uh, so the building hosted uh, parties, meetings, dances, uh, Red Cross sewing meetings, and more. Uh, Charlie's simple rule for using the building was, leave it as you found it. And rule number two, if it's a children's activity, an adult must be uh, present. Uh, by the late 18, 1980s, uh, however, the, uh, the building was not being used, and the Clay family donated the school building to the town. Uh, immediately, the Clinton Historical Society formed a work party with their members and other members of the uh, community to clear away the brush it was actually worse uh, than this. Clear away the brush, cut down some trees, and a result of that work party and some other work by other people, this is uh, the way it came at, uh, at the late 1980s. Uh, unfortunately, the building continued to be non-used and under for the next 25 years, uh, it gradually uh, disappeared, uh, deteriorated uh, to the point that when the town board considered moving this building to this site, the only thing that was salvageable was the walls, the four walls, because the roof had leaked for 25 years. Things were in pretty bad shape. But the walls held up. In fact, holding up is a good term because these walls are attached to a timber frame that had been prepared on the site next door. And you can see that the, one of the walls is being lifted. Here's the closer shot. You can see that it's being put into place and it will be then fastened to the uh, timber frame. And when the school was finished, it had a very close resemblance to the original school, but it has the 160-year-old walls. And again, it's another example of how we're trying to protect our, our uh, historic uh, buildings. The second historic uh, building to arrive in Schultzville was the Masonic Hall. This is a postcard around 1907. Um, this building was built through the bequest of Theodore Schultz, Theodore Gus Schultz, a resident and a mason in uh, Schultzville. Uh, he donated, uh, or he gave $2,000 and the land to build the uh, Masonic Hall in 1865. The, the Warren Lodge Masons grew, uh, and by the time of 1958 came around, they were very strong. They had over 50 members, and they built an addition to the back of the hall for the for the kitchen for banquets and a meeting room as well. So they were doing pretty well at the uh, late 50s. Unfortunately, uh, like other organizations like the Grange in recent years, membership uh, dwindled and there were only a handful of uh, members left and they couldn't really afford to keep up the building and pay the taxes. So they offered the building to the Clinton Historical Society and this was in 1999. The Historical Society accepted the building on three conditions. The first is that the society would restore the building and maintain it. The second was that the Masons would be, excuse me, continue to use the building for the ceremonies and their meetings upstairs. And the third was that the building would be used for community purposes. And that was a, a mutual agreement. What the society did immediately was recruit a lot of uh, citizens. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry. This is Theodore Schultz. Theodore Schultz, uh, unfortunately, he died at a young age, around uh, 23 from tuberculosis, but he did have the foresight to uh, give that uh, bequest to, to build a hall. But this is a picture of the five foot by seven foot portrait that still hangs in the Masonic Hall on the second floor. 
If you haven't seen that second floor, it's got a beautiful barrel ceiling of wainscot like this. It's uh, very attractive. So Theodore is still with us. This is what the uh, Historical Society started with. The building had deteriorated. Um, and through a bunch of work parties and fundraisers, some of you may remember the open mic sessions that we had. We also had the uh, February Valentine's dinner for many years. And we were able to uh, transform that into this beautiful building, which was, became an asset again to the, to the, to the, uh, to the uh, community. However, um, trying to find civic organizations to use the building and support the building uh, was so difficult, we, they were unable to find any. So after 13 years, uh, they approached the town who was looking for a building uh, for the historic site. And through mutual agreement, uh, the town purchased the building at a very nominal price and uh, moved the building down to the site. Here's the building leaving the original site and going onto uh, Center Road. And you'll notice that it's not being towed by a truck. Or oxen. <laughs> the tires here, and it's called a truck assembly, are self-propelled. So there's one in front, and there's actually two in back, back corners. And there's a fellow doing, handling the uh, remote control, controlling the steering of these trucks onto the road and down the road. Now, the next picture, I think, is especially interesting. The house, the, the hall, is meeting another structure, the Clinton Alliance Church. And what's unique about this is that church was also built from a bequest from Theodore Schultz. He gave $3,000 and the land to build the church. So it's kind of like uh, one Gus building is meeting the other Gus building at this moment in time. And here we are arriving at the final destination, uh, and it's ready to have the uh, concrete um, basement built, which will hold uh, offices and other purposes. And you can see on the left side where the uh, wing had been uh, taken off. So we, the wings were not brought down with the original building. So today, the three agreements are still in place for this building. One, it has been restored and will be, continue to be maintained. Two, the Masons continue to use the building as they have for since 1865 for their ceremonies and meetings. And three, obviously, it's put to community purposes. So again, it was a very successful project. So I think uh, town residents are, are very proud of our unique and beautiful historic center with, with the, what I'll say is uh, four buildings. It's a very unique asset. Other towns do not have this. And I think we owe a debt to the town board that um, had this vision and made it a uh, reality. Uh, again, it shows, I think, the pride that this community has in keeping their historic buildings alive and, and reutilized. So to credit the, uh, the town board at that time, uh, Jeff uh, Burns was the supervisor and the spearhead for this vision that became a reality. And members were Michael Apollonia, Dan Budd, Dean Michael, and Frank Venezia. So we, I think we owe them uh, our gratitude for this. Thank you. I'm going to move along to uh, Wings Hall, and I'll answer questions uh, at the end. Uh, Wings Hall, uh, before I died in uh, 1920, a lot was going, over, going on in uh, Clinton Hollow, because there was a building, a barn actually, called Wings Hall. It was a dance hall. And this was the brainchild of Smith Wing, who owned both the home and the barn uh, behind the home. Um, this whole story of Wings Hall is recounted by his daughter who wrote a chronicle. Her name was um, Irma Wing, and uh, she actually wound up being in the band in the dance band for the, the, for the barn. But Smith had this vision, and he was very excited about it, but as Irma tells us, her mother was not excited. In fact, her reaction was, Smith, you want to build a what? You know, it just didn't get it. But he was uh, persuasive, and he uh, convinced her that this would be a success and a welcome in the community. So he did actually uh, start the music hall, uh, um, the dance hall, in 1907. Uh, this is what it looks like in later years. Uh, as it became more popular, he kept adding and adding to the barn until eventually it was 80 feet long, large barn. And here is a um, poster of 1908, the second year of operation, 
showing that uh, he was advertised in the Grand Couture Dance, and it was under the direction of George Rutherford, who taught Irma how to play the cornet, and that's why she was in, in the band. Um, the, the, the place, excuse me, the dance hall in the early years was um, running three dances a week, which was pretty good. And as many as 600 people would come to attend these dances. Many of them were summer residents, excuse me, summer um, um, temporary people. What do you call them? Boarders. They were summer boarders. Summer boarding was a very big thing in this town because people, uh, farmers, use it to supplement their income, their farm income, by taking in boarders. And because the train service was so good, and there was a train right into uh, Clinton Corners from uh, Poughkeepsie. So uh, a number of families did convert, and this is one of the Wing families, and they called their uh, cottage Idle Wing Cottage. This building still exists. It's right across from Jeannie Bean's store, and it was at one time Harold Fountain's uh, business establishment. So young and old came to these dances, as you see in this picture here. Uh, there's a good mix of uh, age groups here. The other thing you might notice is there's a bar across the uh, top there. They were spaced every 10 feet. They hold the sides in. Uh, they were structural. The problem is if you were six feet or over, you had to be really careful. <laughs> Vassa girls were uh, very uh, happy to come to this place. It was well populated. They came in mass because they could get the train in Poughkeepsie and go off at Clinton Corners and walk down to the, uh, the dance hall. So this was a big draw for the uh, Vassa girls. This was the soda bar, and I have to tell you that nothing stronger than soda was ever served at this bar, not while Smith was there. And you get a soda for 10 cents, you could also get an ice cream for 10 cents. This was a band, one of the bands, there were several bands, and in this particular case, the fiddler was the uh, local uh, blacksmith. Um, Mr. Marshall received an email last week. It was a person who found out about this, uh, today's event, but she lives out of state, and she was writing to say that she was sorry that she couldn't attend. But she wanted to share a couple of memories she had of Wings Hall. Her, name was, her maiden name was Carolyn Tellur. Tellurs were um, pretty popular in uh, Clinton Corners. And she said, uh, I lived next door to Wings Hall in the 30s and 40s. On Saturday nights, my brothers and I would sit side by side by my bedroom window and listen to the music and sounds of the happy dancers. On Sunday morning, we went out to the grassy area in front of the hall and found coins that had been dropped and soda bottles and that we turned in at Roy Wing's store. Two cents for some, five cents for others. We love hearing reminiscences like this. Uh, another important occurrence uh, happened in 1920 when Franklin Roosevelt came to Wings Hall for a Democratic rally. He was the uh, speaker, and Irma writes that she remembers uh, shaking his hand. It was a big moment for her. Uh, the hall did close in 1950 because of other uh, pressures on Roy Wing, who was trying to handle the store as well as the uh, dance hall. So it had been in continuous operation for 43 years. Uh, some years later, during Clinton Community Day, the local flower uh, group held, held their flower shows in the, uh, in the hall. Some of you may remember that. Unfortunately, oh, I'm sorry. Here's another poster. This was taken, this was done around 1943-44 because it says plus war tax. And the uh, facilities are, are both here up in front. So after standing for a hundred years, uh, the building did deteriorate. If you take a close look, you can see a wavy roof, which indicates a, a structural problems and lack of foundation. The foundation sills pretty much rotted away. And it became a safety hazard, and the owner had to um, demolish the, the building in 2009. One noticeable, notable occurrence when Wings Hall that always comes to my mind is that the parents of Jeff Burns, our former supervisor, met at Wings Hall and got married. We have Jeff. And my thinking was, well, what if they had never, married, had never met at Wings Hall? Would we have Jeff Burns today? And if not, would we have a town historical center? And that thought keeps occurring to me. You never know. 
I'd like to thank the uh, Clinton Historical Society for several of these images that you've seen today. They have an extensive uh, file of vintage photos, which reminds me, if any of you have vintage photos of town that you think would be of interest, we'd love to copy them. We would scan them and return the originals. And if you have something, uh, please uh, see Mr. Marshall later. Uh, he would appreciate it. I'd uh, like to thank you very much for your really great attention and you had great questions. And thank you very much and look forward to more Lunch and Learn sessions. Thank you to the library.